Hello, my name is Aaron Gill and welcome to 100 Stories Deep. Uh, today I'm going to be reading the first chapter from a novel called The Gorilla by the Tunisian writer Kamal Rihai. Um, and it's a story based on a real life event that happened in Tunisia in the summer of 2009. Um, yeah, so the book's called The Gorilla and um, the chapter is called Insurrection. And the reason why I've chosen this story today is because um, I think it's just really descriptive of um, some of the different uh, acts of protest that are happening um, in, in today's world. And we'll talk about that a little bit more after the video. About one o'clock in the afternoon, the wind is busy rolling along some beer can that has been drained of its contents in the deserted street. A massive silence links the arch of the sea gate with the enormous clock tower. The clock tower in November 7 Square is a symbol of the coup mounted by General Zine al Abidin Ben Ali against President Habib Bourguiba on November 7, 1987. The clock tower stands where a statue of Bourguiba stood before, where Mohammed V Street crosses Avenue Habib Bourguiba. The tranquility of the deserted capital is disturbed by its well-known paranoiac, who circles the tower for the last time, then starts pushing people away, warning them of the poisonous hands of the clock high above. He then starts to throw stones, pieces of iron, houses, trees, crows and goats at imaginary enemies, things that are invisible to anyone else. He imagines that he's picking up he imagines that he is picking them up from the marble base of the wrought iron clock tower that flaunts itself like a whore in the last years of the struggle. People have forgotten the days of forced disappearances and fear. Not a single person has disappeared for over a year. People are enjoying the sacred siesta of August and the temperature is over 50 degrees and the devil of midday picks the lice picks the crab lice caught in the, in the transient lust. Ambulance and police sirens suddenly massacre the slumbering siesta and everyone rushes with the traces of drowsiness and dried semen stains still on them to the streets of streets. Something is happening at the lofty clock tower. Cordons of police officers surround the place. Rapid intervention forces hide behind cold helmets and pressed back with batons to onlookers at whom car horns honk from every direction. Human beings without number look up to the top of the clock. A small, remote figure, apparently no bigger than a finger, is climbing down the clock tower with the speed of a cockroach. Everybody is amazed, for he is about to announce the end of the world. Next, strain to look at the bold climber who has reached the top of the clock and is holding on to one of its hands. He takes a water bottle out of his back pocket, has a drink and then empties what is left over his head. He removes his leather belt and secures himself with it to some iron rings and turns to the crowd that have gathered below like ants. Nervous policemen surround the crowd and run in all directions, talking into their radio sets. Gesturing nervously, they ask the man up there to come down, but there is out of bounds. <clears throat> Meanwhile, he mutters something, the content of which is lost in the city air. Only fragments of what he says fall like droppings from a ram. There is a movement from his left hand and he waves right and left indicating his refusal to come down. The police carry on pushing the people back who are circling the clock tower like dung beetles. They try to ban any photography, to silence voices and to prevent mobile phone cameras from being focused on the hands of the clock. Traffic comes to a standstill and the car engines throb 
like the veins of a 100 meter sprinter on the starting line. Something serious is going on. No one has been bold enough to get near the clock for the two years since a soccer fell, since a soccer fan fell off it in a delirium of happiness after his team won the President of the Republic Cup. On that day, the water bubbling up from the fancy fountain beneath the clock turned into a pool of red. From that evening, that clock was subject to strict surveillance. It occupied a strategic site in the heart of the capital, regardless of what the paranoiac sometimes said about it. The crowds grow, and the front rows are, are reinvigorated by tourists who pour in from the beaches and from the hotels nearby. The policemen's batons are a little muted, but the men grow more agitated. They run about everywhere, barricading the pavements and extending the restricted area. Meanwhile, the man clings to the end of the hand at the top of the clock like a gecko. For years on the side of this clock stored a statue of Borgiva on a horse, with one of its forelegs raised to the bases of those who looked up. It was said that its raised hoof in the face of Ibn Khaladun, whose statue had been planted like a bad dream opposite Bordiba, at and at his request, and he was swept away by order of the present rider. The statue was removed, and there sprouted in its place a giant clock tower with a cold cement pedestal. It was not long before it gave seed to a small versions that were planted in each town and village, while statues of the leader were banished from every part of the land. The clock was changed for another that came in from Switzerland or England or America. There were conflicting reports about the nationality of the new clock and a bronze plinth was decorated in an arabesque style. Groundless talk without proof about the clock of the unknown origin was installed in the heart of the city that was heedless of its sons. No trace was left of the leader whose statue was moved to La, to La Goulette to gaze at the bitter sea. Spider-Man remains above the restricted zone, supporting himself with a leather belt from which he hangs as he swings about, like a professional mountaineer. Below, the world, bewildered. The crowds grow after workers leave their offices. One whole hour passes out by and the police are chewing their sticks, unable to persuade the man of the hour to come down. Among the crowd, strange things are going on. Thieves and pickpockets are busy stealing mobile phones and necklaces from the women onlookers. Climbing to the top of the clock is a serious crime. An unpardonable sin. What is happening today undermine security. The police are facing a dilemma. How can they get on top of the situation when the scandal is unfolding in front of everybody? Citizens and foreigners and the whole country at the height of the tourist season too. An officer always bites the head of one helpless policeman, asking him for the thousandth time, how did that dirty son of a bitch get up there? Where were you, you stupid idiots? How did you let him get near the clock and let him climb up as well? Elsewhere, a policeman pounces on a tourist and snatches the camera that he was pointing at the clock. The policeman whips out the battery and nervously hands back the camera, cautioning him against using it again. The barricaded area is a restricted security zone. The crowd start to mutter about the behaviour of the police as they clear a large space between the people and the location of the incident. Their grievances become louder and when they see the man on the clock waving his hand and addressing the chief of the rapid intervention forces. As he is waving the empty water bottle about, they understand. He's asking for water. Another bottle is brought. A policeman scales the clock towers in a stairway. He throws the man the end of the rope tied around the bottle. The man grabs it and, 
after the policeman tries to open negotiations, orders him to go back down. Nothing of his conversation with the policeman is heard. People are busy listening to the ravings of one young man who is shouting. They're showing what's happening on television and you can hear what the guy is saying. Look, I've had the text message giving the news and the frequency of the channel. People take out their phones. The message reached everybody at the same time. The policemen get more het up and frenziedly start looking around for something or the other. Another group of policemen come and busy themselves searching buildings all around for the source of the transmission and for the camera that is filming the incident. Some people rush home, but crowds remain, and others arrive until the pavements and streets are packed to overflowing. Thank you for listening. That was the chapter Insurrection taken from the novel The Gorilla by a Tunisian novel uh, by Kamal Riahai and that was translated by Peter Clark. Uh, yeah, I've, I think um, what I'd like you to do to, to, um, in reflection on this story is to think about some of um, the incidents of protests that have been happening across this country across um across north america united states across lebanon beirut um and you know going back a little bit further the arab spring the arab spring places in tunisia uh, in 2010 2009 and i just want you to yeah just want you to think about maybe uh, an image that you've seen a striking image that you've seen of an individual making an act of defiance. So, for example, I, I can immediately think of that, that image of Sophia Khan from Birmingham um, yeah, a couple of years ago when she was faced um, face to face with the EDL. Uh, I think of the Sudanese woman earlier this year, or was it sort of late last year, on top of the police car giving a rallying speech um, and inciting particularly black women to to revolution um yeah i want you to 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 think about uh the the images the of revolution the individual images of revolution um and ask yourself what story is being told here who took the picture is it an honest depiction of what was happening um or have the media tried to use this one image to to call them crazy you know it's really easy to 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 shut down a protest if you say it's just one person acting on behalf of others and by the way that person's as what um is described in here a paranoiac somebody who's a little bit crazy um so yeah that's what i'd quite like you to do um and thank you for listening again um you can hear more stories in from a series by subscribing to our youtube channel by clicking the link below and subscribe on our socials and yeah all right, till next time, ta-da.